Hi, I'm Rachel with Rachel Ray's Crime Corner, and I'm back with another true crime story for you. So sit back and relax, or get busy with your favorite chore and put in them earbuds. So I hope each of you is having a wonderful day, and that you'll stick around to hear this story. The story comes from the 1800s. Rachel Sharpless was born in 1831 in Pennsylvania to Aaron and Abigail Thatcher Sharpless. She was a teacher of a school near Rocky Hills in Westchester County. On the morning of Saturday, September 28, 1850, the students of Rachel arrived at the school, ready to begin their lessons. And yes, I said Saturday. By 1840, the school year was about eight months long. Some schools were open for only six or seven months. The school year was divided into two terms, a winter term from November to March and a summer term from May to late August or early September. The actual days and lengths of the two terms were set by each school district. The school week was usually six days. Sometimes students would have a half day of school on the second or third Saturday of each month. I wonder how kids today would enjoy attending school on Saturday. On this particular Saturday morning in 1850, the children arrived at school and were unfortunately not greeted with the kind smile of their teacher. Instead, they were met with a most horrid sight. Their teacher had been brutally murdered. She was lying in the front of the schoolhouse. A young man, around 19, named George Pharaoh, was in the area at the time. He later told a boy that he had seen the dead body of Rachel near the school, but he had been afraid to go near it. He also said that he had seen no one else close by at the time. Another individual said they had run into George walking down the road on the morning of the murder and that he had mentioned to them that Miss Sharpless had been shot by a large gun while she was unlocking the door of the schoolhouse. The problem with his story was that her body had not been discovered by anyone yet. Later, while talking to someone else, he said he would be a fool to own and be hanged for the murder of Rachel. Eventually, he was indicted for her murder. One thing that contributed to his conviction was the wadding that was used in his gun. Before cartridges came into existence, wadding was used to create a seal between the bullet and the gunpowder. The wadding that was found near the body of Rachel matched a torn copy of the Saturday Evening Post that was found in George's possession. After his conviction, he made a full confession to the prison keeper and one of the inspectors. He said he had noticed that Rachel carried a nice gold watch and chain with her. He came up with a plan to steal it from her, and on the morning of September 28th, he went to the schoolhouse. When he saw Rachel arrive at the schoolhouse to open the door, he fired the gun. But as soon as he did, he could hear some of the students in the distance, and so he fled and wasn't able to even take the watch. After hearing all the evidence, the jury took two and a half hours before rendering a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to be hanged. After the conviction of George Pharaoh, the editor of the Westchester Village Record went to the prison to speak to him. And this is the story as told by George. On the morning of the murder of Rachel Sharpless, he came out from his father's house and went up Boot Road. Mary was along, and she set the dog on him for sport. The dog ran at him and barked. He pointed the gun at the dog several times and snapped it at him. The gun wasn't loaded. He did it to tease Mary. He had often plagued the dog. He did not see W.M. Smith in the barnyard. He then went up to Jonathan Cope's woods to load his gun. He loaded one barrel, then came down by Emmer Thomas's spring house. Oliphant came to him near the spring house and went with him down to the woods. Says he snapped at a robin, but his gun didn't go off. He then went down into the woods and Oliphant went after the cows. 
said he had thought something of Rachel Sharpless before he had started from home, and as his gun snapped when he aimed at the robin, he put up a mark on a tree opposite the bars, or nearly so, and fired at it to see if his gun would go off. The gun went off, and the shots are in the tree. The gun went off, and the shot was in the tree. He loaded his gun again and remained in the woods a quarter of an hour. He then went down to the bridge and looked back, and thought Oliphant saw him. He then went up through the middle of the woods, where he could leave no tracks, and said that the tracks across the creek and in the path along the fence, which had been measured and thought to correspond with his shoes, were not made by him. He said this more than once. He said he loitered about the schoolhouse until after the mistress had passed. As she approached the schoolhouse, he thought she saw him. He got behind a tree and hid himself, and she came around the western side of the schoolhouse. He waited until she came to the door, took the key from her handbag, and thought her attention was arrested by his shadow. He then stepped quickly out on the left side of the tree, that she might have the back of her head towards him. He raised the gun to his shoulder, took rapid aim, and fired. He says the only exclamation she made was, Oh! She fell against the door, dropped to the stone step, and rolled off upon the ground. He looked at her for three minutes, felt sorry as soon as it was done, and was afraid to take the watch for fear they would find him out by it. He then walked slowly west from the schoolhouse, then through the woods, and crossed the road at the corner of Enos Thomas's cornfield. In crossing the road, he jumped up the bank and looked back, and found that he had left no tracks. He went into the woods on the north side of the road, and then into Mary Sharpless's wood. There he loaded his gun and shot twice at a squirrel, but not at the tree which he pointed out to Sheriff Darlington. He did not take Darlington to the right place because he was afraid he might find the wads of his gun. After he committed the murder, he poured the shot out of his shot bag to avoid discovery. Some of it he poured in the woods of Enos Thomas and some of it in Mary Sharpless woods. He said it puzzled him that witnesses had reported hearing only one sound of gunfire that day. He said he had nothing against Rachel. She had never done him any harm. He never even wanted to pay attention to her. He said he wanted a watch, but never thought of shooting anybody else to get one. He didn't even know her watch was gold. He had been to the schoolhouse several times. He was then asked how long he had harbored the idea of shooting her. He said he had been meditating it during the week. He went to the schoolhouse once before to shoot her, but he had decided not to do it. He said he never had it in his head to shoot anybody before. In thinking about it, he sometimes thought it would be horrible to shoot her, but he said... It seemed he was able to do it. As soon as it was done, he said he was sorry for it. He said Mr. Lewis, one of his counsel, was the first person he ever confessed the murder to, and that was the day after his conviction. It was a week prior to this interview. He would not acknowledge it before, because at the start of his trial he thought he could be cleared, but he did not think so towards the end of the trial. He said if he had destroyed that paper he would not have been convicted. He said there was a witness who said that George had told him he was going to get a watch before long. George said he didn't know the man, but that it wasn't true. He said he slept soundly on the night of the murder. It was late when he went to bed. He said it had not troubled his sleep since his imprisonment, and he had never dreamed of Rachel Sharpless. He did say he had thought of the deed a good deal since he had been in prison. He thought of destroying the paper before they found the wad, and after two, he had gotten the paper at Goshen's store and had left a good deal of it on the counter. Pratt Roberts' son was in the store the day he got the paper. He said he didn't think hard about any of the witnesses. He had a good deal to think of to prepare to die and a short time to do it in. He said one of the judges told him it could be some months. It was almost five months later when he would finally pay the price for the murder of Rachel Sharpless. 
The day before his execution, he wrote a letter to his mom. My dear mother, I feel very sorry that I did not take your good advice, which you gave me on the 20th of last September, to go back to my place and stay my time out as you wished me to do. I started on the 28th of September with the thought in my mind of taking Rachel Sharpless's life for the sake of a gold watch. This is what I did it for, for nothing else. Now, my dear mother, I feel very sorry for the trouble I have thrown you into by my bad conduct. But I feel and know that God has forgiven me for what I have done. I remember when you were here of having some conversation with you about trying to meet me in a better world and your promise that you would try to meet me in glory. These were your words. I remember giving you my likeness to remember me by. When you were done with it, you were to give it to Sister Elizabeth. Then I gave you a tract, the dairyman's daughter, for yourself. Another for Elizabeth, the history of little Jane. Another for Sister Rebecca, the history of the lost son. Then I gave my brother John one, a dialogue on the Ten Commandments. And I gave my father one, the title of which I now forget, one tract for each. And I hope you will read them and try to lead a better life through the world than you did when I was with you. My dear mother, I feel very thankful to you for your kindness to me since I've been in prison. Many a tear have I shed thinking I should never see home again, but was soon to be launched into eternity. My dear mother, on the 24th of this month, that is, on last Sunday, my brother John came to me early in the morning for the last time that I expected to see him in this world. And I had some conversation with him about Aaron Sharpless, that he had come to see me the day before. He came in, and I spoke to him about the murder. He asked me what I did it for. I told him my motive was to get the watch. He said, thee could have got the watch without acting as thee did. I then asked him for his forgiveness. He said it was a hard thing to get over, but... After studying a minute or two, he said, I will forgive thee. My last request to my brother was that he would promise me faithfully to become a Christian. He said he would. We then parted, never expecting to meet again on earth. I thought he took it very hard. I took notice of tears rolling down his cheeks. Later in the day, Sister Elizabeth came to see me. I spoke to her about as I did to John, about preparing for another world. She promised she would. 11 o'clock a.m., I expect, in about 25 hours, to be in eternity. I feel myself prepared to go with the hope of meeting you in heaven, if you will only strive. You said when you were here to Mr. Stewart that it would have been happy for you if I had died when I was a child, but now, my dear mother, I hope to be as happy as if I had died when I was young. I wish, my dear mother, that you would send the other children to Sabbath school, that they may learn the way of salvation and become Christians. I have many more things that I would like to say to you but I cannot. My dear mother, I bid you farewell. Keep this letter and read it to the family when I'm gone. George Pharaoh. The summer before the killing of Rachel, George's mom had mentioned a dream, nightmare, that she had. She shared it with George and the rest of her family. She dreamed that George had killed Rachel Sharpless and said she hoped it wouldn't come true. August 29, 1851, George was led to the gallows erected in the yard of the Chester County Prison on Market Street in Westchester and hanged. As he was standing at the gallows, he addressed his father, quote, 
Father, you know you have not acted a good part towards me. You have never afforded me a good example to follow, but permitted me to grow up in ignorance and vice. End quote. The site today houses the Chester County Justice Center. George's body was taken down after half an hour and placed in a walnut coffin. It was then removed from the prison and given to his parents for interment. He was buried at midnight, and the grave was guarded for several nights to deter any curiosity seekers. George Pharaoh was not the only criminal in his family. James Patton was a respectable farmer who resided a mile and a half north of Westchester, He and his wife had two sons, Wesley, age 14, and John, age 11, and an infant daughter. On Sunday morning, May 25, 1845, James, his wife, and his son, John, left their home to attend the Methodist church. Wesley had not attended church that day due to an illness he had been experiencing. The family left their baby daughter at home to be attended by their servant girl. Around 10.30 that morning, a man named Jabez Boyd showed up at the Patton's home. He snuck in and quietly locked the door. He placed his hand on the boy's head and said, quote, How are you getting, Wesley? End quote. He said this because Wesley had been sick for some time. The boy didn't even have time to answer the question before Boyd grabbed some tongs and hit young Wesley in the head with such force that he fractured the boy's skull. The poor servant girl could hear the horrific murder from the room where she was with the little baby. She had the strength of mind to gather the infant from the cradle and escape out of the window. As she was opening the window, she said she heard Wesley scream, Jim, don't kill me. Then she heard a blow, a fall, and all was still. She ran to the neighbor's house to get help. When the neighbors arrived at the Patton's home, they found the doors locked, so they had to enter through the window. The sight that lay before them was horrendous. The monster had beaten the boy mercilessly and threw him into the fire. Unfortunately, it was believed that Wesley had not been completely dead when he was thrown into the fire because it looked like he had struggled to get away and was only partially in the fire. The sight was absolutely devastating. There was an immediate search of the house for the deranged murderer, and then people went in every direction to search for the monster. He was arrested about two hours later at his father's home. At the time of his arrest, he protested and said he had not been at James Patton's house for two weeks. He had tried to wash his clothes, but they were still blood-stained, and his boots literally had a clot of blood still on them. While he was being questioned, he maintained an air of indifference, and laughed and joked with his acquaintances as though nothing had happened. Jabez was around 22 years old and a bricklayer by trade. Some time ago, he had resided in Westchester, but had committed some offense that had landed him in jail. He had broken out of jail and had only been seen publicly within the past few weeks. He was a very disliked man with a very bad character. Upon investigation of the home, it was also discovered that Boyd had robbed the home of $50 in gold and notes before fleeing the scene of the crime. There was reason to believe that if the girl and baby had not escaped, Boyd would have lit the whole house on fire to erase any evidence. He denied being anywhere near the Patton's home, but Mr. Patton had seen him around the home the previous Sunday. While the Pattons were grieving the loss of their firstborn son, their younger son was grieving himself to death. He had unfortunately witnessed the harrowing sight of the mutilated disfigured remains of his beloved brother, and no matter what the family tried to do to get his mind off the memories of that sight, nothing worked. The Pattons now lost both of their sons, but thanks to a brave young lady, they still had their baby daughter. A man by the name of George Peace had been Boyd's inspiration 
deaths, so to speak. George Pease had killed a man and burned all the evidence. Boyd had attended the trial. George Pease was acquitted and within a week was arrested again on charges of arson. Boyd's trial went much differently than George Pease's trial. His trial was short, and once all the evidence was heard, the jury deliberated for a whole 12 minutes before rendering a verdict, guilty of murder in the first degree. 23-year-old Jabez Boyd expressed that he had asked forgiveness for his sins and was ready to be executed for the murder of Wesley Patton. George Pharaoh was actually hung on the same gallows with the same rope as his uncle, Jabez Boyd. Jabez Boyd was the brother of George Pharaoh's mother, Susanna Boyd Pharaoh. I hope you enjoyed this story today. Thank you so much for taking time to listen. If you stuck around for the whole story, if you wouldn't mind giving me a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and also subscribing to the channel so that you'll know when I put out more content like this. And if you want to put any comments or suggestions, please do so. Just remember to be kind. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. May God bless you and keep you.